Your welcome is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Now, most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to me talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now, which is getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy. You can save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average and Auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts are having multiple vehicles in your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progress will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. For his casual insurance company affiliates, national annual average insurance savings by new customer survey to save with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. And there's nothing going on tonight. We can sit here like now. maybe just get drunk and stay inside. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us, this is going to be a lot of fun. We have Seamus Coughlin. He is the head of Freedom Tunes, a very popular YouTube channel. I hope you guys all subscribe to it, where you make funny little animated shorts about various political personalities, and they all go wide. Um, I'm really kind of impressed with how successful your channel is, because you, you see it pop up everywhere. Um, I had been under the impression that animation is something that is exorbitant. Obviously, it's gotten cheaper, you know, over the years. Like, is it as expensive as I think? What's your process? So, fortunately, my animation it's it's trash. So, you know, super cheap. Uh, I'm I'm being facetious, of course, and I can't make the kinds of self-deprecating jokes I used to about the art on Freedom Tunes because. While it used to mostly be handled by myself and then myself with, with uh, you know, one or two people helping, we've grown to the point where I've been able to bring people on to focus a lot on the animation for me so I can kind of step away from that uh, from time to time when I need to. So I just want to say I think my animation team is phenomenal. They do great work. Animation is generally very expensive, very time consuming. And in some instances, it's thankless because... Right now, particularly, YouTube is favoring long-form content. That's sort of been the paradigm for, I oh. want to say, almost the past 10 years or so. Wait, can I and interrupt you? Because I thought sure. I've been told that you have to do these shorts and they want everyone to start doing shorts. That's Is that inaccurate? So shorts are pretty big and they'll get a lot of visibility. But there was a shift right around the time... I think this is like right around the time that PewDiePie blew up. And he might have blown up as a result of this, but don't quote me on it. Uh there were all sorts of people that they had to change the algorithm to favor long form content. And part of the reason for that was people would upload like a clickbait title and then people would click the video it would have nothing to do with the title. It could literally just be like a Rick roll or something, but they'd pull in all sorts of ad revenue because they got a lot of views. And so YouTube said, well, we can't pay people for the amount of views they get. Here's how we're going to solve this problem. We're going to pay for the amount of minutes people okay. spend watching the video. Because of that, short form content gets snubbed right. because when you're doing animation in particular, you know, it can take a week, two weeks, even three weeks to do a two minute animated short. And then the most you could possibly get in terms of minutes watched is two minutes, right? Right. But if I do a 45 minute long stream that took me 45 minutes to make and it's engaging and entertaining enough for most of my audience to sit all the way through, I could make obviously multiples of what an animation channel could make with a slight fraction of the budget. So it's been very tricky, but we've been able to maneuver in some pretty creative ways. And I'm very happy with uh, what I've built. Again, I give a lot of the credit here to God and also to my fantastic team. I don't think there's anyone else in the industry who's really doing something like this. And if there is, they're very few and far between. Short form content is not, um, as I've said, in the animation world, it's not generally very profitable, at least right now. Are you, I, I'm not trying to be annoying, but are you allowed to like say like what programs you use and what yeah, you're Yeah, for sure. Okay. So that, that's what I'm interested in. Like, what's the actual process? How do you construct this? Because this is the kind of thing where I think a lot of young people, it's a great easy, no, I don't want to say easy, but it's a great, <laughs> it's a great like you don't need to have some kind of gatekeeper, whereas mm -hmm. I'm someone with a computer. Please stop calling me. I'm, no one likes me. You um, know what? I haven't silenced my phone either. Yeah, so yeah. If, I'm, 
If I'm someone with a computer, this would be a great way, I would think, to kind of build a platform. Whereas if you're some guy with a mic, it's very hard to kind of break out. But if you're creating animation, that's something that's going to be unique, special. We all enjoy it. I think that would be like an opportunity for a lot of people who are young and, and talented. Yeah, so it is. But here's where the difficulty comes in. I mentioned that you have to have longer form content if you really want to be privileged by the algorithm and pulling good ad revenue. On top of that, you also want to upload very frequently. And it's tremendously difficult to upload animation on a frequent basis. So when things are going really well, we're able to do two videos a week, sometimes three videos a week. And those are like the most extraordinary weeks we've had. Uh, but you look at like Tim, right? And he's able to upload, my goodness, like three videos a day per channel. And good for him. I mean, the man works hard. He's working all day long to do that. But you can work all day long and have a solid work ethic with animation. And you're just never going to put right. three videos out per day. And so what I would say is if you're an animator, if you're or you're interested in becoming one and interested in getting into cartooning, definitely give it a shot. And you're absolutely correct. There's no gatekeeper. So you don't have to sit there and, and worry about whether you're going to get financed by a studio, right? Because part of the incredible thing is, I believe it was Andrew Stanton of Pixar who said this, but with animation, you get nothing for free. But part of what that means is you can create, you, you have to create everything from the ground up, but you also get to create everything from the ground up. If right. I'm filming something live action and there's a prop I don't have, I just don't have that prop, right? If there's an, if, if I can't cast someone who looks like the person who I want to play this role, then I just don't get that person for the role. So it's, it's really a double-edged sword in the creative expression and the freedom that you can get with animation if you're willing to work hard at it and put the time in is absolutely unparalleled. But I would say it is a team effort if you really want to upload things consistently. It's very much a team effort. So what programs are you using to, to kind of create your work? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry for sidestepping that one. Uh, I, I feel like I'm animate. talking to a politician. This is like the first time I'm <laughs> I'm sorry. I just like, I want, because I want young people who are interested in animation to like be inspired. And I want them to do it. I want them to try to get their start, but... Yeah, Adobe Animate would have been a simpler answer. <laughs> Adobe Animate? Animate? Yeah, so the Adobe Suite, especially if you're a student, now, now you went from uh, talking to a politician to an Adobe salesman because <laughs> even though I'm not a huge fan of uh, everything that they do as a, as a company, as I'm not with most big corporations, you, can, you basically rent their software. So okay. when, when I was a kid, if you wanted a copy of Adobe Flash, which is what it was called at the time, it was like $800. Um, and so my first copy was for $50 because it was from like the 90s and, you know, I bought it on eBay. Nowadays, if you're a student with the discounts, you can get, I think it's like you can get the entire Adobe suite for like $20 a month. Oh, wow. That's, that's the animation software. That's the video editing software. That's everything. The prices may have adjusted since I last checked. But for me now, since like it's a, an adult license, a professional license, it's something like $50 a month. Uh, but for one app, if you just want one app, which is the animation app, it's significantly less expensive than that. So my point there is I don't think it's ever been less expensive to get these kinds of softwares. So that's if it's something you're interested in, I would, I really would, um, I would, I would just get started. And that's kind of what you have to do. I know people don't like hearing that answer. Sometimes they want the sort of, you know, magical explanation of how you can just step into something at the, the highest possible level. But Really, just it, it's going to take a long time, but download some animation software, purchase a copy, start watching animation, um, start pausing it a lot and going through frame by frame and kind of seeing how they're able to make the, the characters move in a, a convincing way and just keep trying to do that. So something I like to do um, is... I think most TV shows are unwatchable and I don't think that's a particularly uh, controversial opinion. What is really fun for me to do is sit down and watch someone play through a video game. Uh, there's a mm. few of these walkthroughs on the internet. And one which I am absolutely obsessed with is Cuphead. They just recently released the sequel and that was all hand-drawn animation. I know this is kind of out of left field, but are you a Cuphead, Cuphead fan too? So I actually played it for the first time a few weeks ago. Oh. Uh, and I know I'm way late to the game here. When I was in college for animation, it was huge, right? Everyone was talking about it all the time and for good reason. It's it's a remarkable technical achievement. It looks, as you mentioned, it's like hand-drawn stuff. And it looks like, it looks really good. There's no other video game that really has that aesthetic. And if there is, it doesn't pull it off that well. Um, and so I just, yeah, I played it recently 
And I'm kind of glad I did because when people were first talking about Cuphead, I kept hearing it's this, um, it's this sort of like traditionally animated video game. And I was like, how is that possible? I was kind of trying to think through ways you could do that for like a very complex level. Um, it turns out it's basically all just boss fights, which again, yes. still, still a technical challenge. But I remember, I, yeah, I, I was like kind of rattling my mind every time it came out, like how they did it. That must, that must have been tremendously difficult. And I'm sure it still was, but not as frightening as I had initially thought. But no, very fun game, very pleasing to look at. So I want to look at your uh, Twitter bio because oh, no. there's a couple of things that I want to talk to you about. The first thing on your Twitter bio is Catholic. Mm -hmm. And the third thing, the third line is uh, former libertarian. Which of those do you want to talk about first? I guess Catholicism, uh, they, they sort of go hand in hand. Um, so let, let, let's talk about this because I was just recently at the best man at a Catholic wedding for oh, the beautiful. very failed podcaster, Tom Woods. And I had been at a Catholic wedding a couple of years mm. prior and I had gone to yeshiva, which is Jewish school. Mm -hmm. And we learned everything in Hebrew and, and it was very traditional and would, all that. And one of the things I really appreciated about going to these weddings was that when you're hearing these ceremonies, you're hearing the same thing someone, you know, a thousand years ago heard in Rome or 500 years ago in some boondocks village in, in England. And knowing that you're kind of sharing this verbatim experience with these people across the world and across time. And I think there's something extremely powerful with that. It's the same thing with learning things in Hebrew. It's like, okay, these, mm -hmm. these words have been said for th literally thousands of years uh, in the same way and in the same uh, mechanism. And, you know, I was very lucky because in high school, I found two writers that really influenced me, Ayn Rand and Camille Paglia. And Cal Paglia is like a hardcore leftist. She's but, fascinating. But she will not, she constantly talks about how much she loves the Catholic church and the ritualism and, and the iconography and, and so on and so forth. And all my Catholic friends are, I, I think disturbed is an understatement as what has become of the church. And for people who don't appreciate this, uh, in the 60s, they had something called Vatican II, which was the idea that we're going to make the Catholic Church hip and cool and modern, which is something that's like saying we're going to make Coca-Cola healthy for you. It's not That's not <laughs> the selling point of the Catholic Church. The point is, this is a straight line from Peter to whoever the current pope is. And what's even more just so we're, instead of having the, the rights in Latin, it's going to be in English or in Spanish, to the point where they would not let my friend have his wedding service in Latin. And he said, what if I bring in my own priest? They said, no, you can't do it. And that to me is just one of the ways how the church has recently changed, where as an outsider, I'm like, this is really crazy to me. I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I appreciate that. So there's a lot to sort of dig into there. with that. So I, I want to sort of distinguish between... Um, the reform of, of the mass and the sort of the creation of the Novus Ordo in Vatican II, because they are technically different things. Um, but when you look at like the documents of Vatican II, it says things like Gregorian chant must be given pride of place, all things being equal uh, in the liturgy. And of course, you go to most masses in the United States and like Gregorian chant is not, I guess, you know, all things aren't equal. I'm not, you know, that, that language, I don't know how to work through it theologically. And I have been kind of careful recently. I'm trying to get more well read on a number of these Catholic issues before I say anything like too outspoken about them, because I just want to be extremely careful about not accidentally misrepresenting anything. But yeah, part of the idea of, of Vatican II and part of what was stated, I think the original quote for, was, uh, I believe from John the 23rd was, we want to like open the windows and, and air the place out, something like that. And if you really want to talk to someone who knows a lot more about this than I do, Timothy Gordon is, is great. But when it comes to the, the Second Vatican Council, it was accompanied by a lot of Catholics saying things like, my particular pet project is in the spirit of Vatican II. So this just became a phrase that everyone threw around to get whatever they wanted, uh, like liturgically or catechetically in their diocese, even if what they were asking for either had nothing to do with Vatican II or was explicitly contradicted by Vatican II. And so a lot of the damage that's been done has just been by individual liberal actors in the church saying, I want X, Y, and Z. 
and they're not necessarily being a stop put to that. That's a that's that's a massive like oversimplification of the wider problem. But yeah, I do think it's very sad that your friend was not able to have a, a TLM for their wedding because I attend the Latin Mass and I think it's so beautiful. And like you, I, I think there's something so incredible about being able to hear that ancient sacred language. And that was one thing growing up that I always did admire the Jews for was the fact that many of them still taught their children Hebrew. I thought that that was so fascinating. Um, I think there's something wonderful about having a language set aside for God, you know, and, and speaking to him in the language that you're not like cussing in and like saying vulgar and mundane things in. And for whatever reason, that's not a tradition that as much value has been placed on over the past 50 or 60 years, but it's seeing a resurgence, right? That That's part of what's so interesting is like, th there is a resurgence. A lot of, whenever I go to the Latin mass, it's almost all young people. And I'm not sure if you heard that about Shia LaBeouf converting to Catholicism. But I mean, uh, is, is you really want him on your team? I mean, the guy's- <laughs> We want, I, I, look, look. He's, clear, he's, clear, he's, he's clearly literally mentally ill. Do you think so? Did you not hear when he was calling the cop the N-word? How long ago is this? A, a few years ago. They, it's oh, 4chan right. broke him with that, we, we will not divide us stuff. He, mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. No, but if you look into him, I, I think the guy's legit uh, unwell. It's possible. It's possible. I don't know his individual circumstances. I guess the point I was trying to make with him is that he said part of what attracted him to the faith was the Latin mass. That said, I want everyone on our team. You know, if, if everyone who wants to convert, we all have a past. Everyone's done messed up things. And I believe everyone... See, this is the difference future. between this is between us and you. Uh -huh. You guys can have the crazies. We have enough crazies. <laughs> we want we them yeah. in our house. Yeah, we want them. We love. Yeah, them. come here. More all power. The crazies, come here. You. I think there was. Uh, he's not exactly my favorite, but there was a, a great Oscar Wilde quote. He said something like, "Catholics are like either sinners or, or saints. If you want respectability, become Anglican." Um, Catholic people, we're, we're, we're just crazy in the best way, I think. Uh, well, you know his lover, Bozy. If, if you feel a little different or outside the box, like you are more than welcome. Uh, uh, well, his, you know, Oscar Wilde's lover, Bozy, became yes. a hardcore Catholic, yeah. Did he really? But Oh yeah, and, and a hard no. like a like a quasi Nazi. He was like one of these like uh, wow. like the Jews are running everything types. Wow, yeah, wow. yeah. And then, so that is, I, that's not how I expected that story to end. Interesting. I got I got two plot twists right there, <laughs> <laughs> all in one. You're like, do you know Oscar yeah. Wilde's uh, ex became a Nazi? Oh, or became a Catholic? Nazi, oh, wow, kind of and he became a quasi Nazi. Oh. Yeah, like kind of alt right before the term was a thing, uh, mm -hmm. and he basically was kind of well, and he tried to marry women. It was a whole, it was a whole kind of a, a situation. Douglas Murray's first book uh, was about Bozy, um, and, and yeah. he's an interesting historical figure because um, he was a lot younger than Oscar, and people kind of forget about him. Wilde, I think, died what in eighteen ninety nine or something, like you know, a completely in, in disrepute in in France where he's where he's now buried. But um, mm -hmm. that that's all his story. So. I mean, what are your thoughts on uh, uh, Pope Francis? Because all the Catholics I know, basically, I don't know that they can use this language, but it's as close to saying that he's satanic as possible. Yeah, it's there's some complexity with him. When it comes to Pope Francis, I generally don't give an opinion on him unless I'm asked, which you have asked, so I'm more than happy to. But on the one hand... The media does, to be fair, take him out of context and misrepresent him on certain things. So one of my favorite examples is from the beginning of his papacy. He said something like he didn't personally believe that hell was a physical location. He thought that it was just a state of the soul being eternally separated from God. And it's true that as Catholics, we believe hell is eternal separation from God. And he was opining on whether it's like an also a physical location or whether it's just a state of the soul. So what he said this was the Pope speaking, but he's not speaking ex cathedra. You know, he's not declaring anything. He's giving his own personal opinion. The media not only runs with it as if he's changing church teaching, but they say Pope Francis says there is no hell or Catholic church does away with teaching in hell, which is completely ridiculous, completely not true. And so you have to be careful. On the other hand, he has said some things that I've, I've found to be troubling. And he's not my favorite Pope. Uh, I want to be charitable here. There's definitely a number of things he's done, which I don't uh, consider to be good. But as Catholics, part of what we understand is that like, not every Pope is going to be good. Uh, you, you can have a, a bad Pope, and there have been some pretty bad Popes throughout history. Because 
while the Pope, in certain instances, you know, he has his authority as the Pope, and when he speaks ex cathedra, um, he does speak infallibly. It's not as if having a bad Pope who does bad things means he's not the Pope or that, like, he doesn't have that, you know, particular power. He's not Christ's vicar, etc. But I, my understanding, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. is that uh, Pope Francis tends to be a little coy. That a lot of times when he's saying his own personal opinion, he's doing that tap dance as if he's speaking ex cathedra and giving people that impression. On, and, and he knows exactly what he's doing in, in terms of moving the needle. I don't know. So th that's a difficult one. I can't speak to his motivations. I think it's probably the case that the media is thinking that way when they're asking him these questions. I mean, consider how old the man is, right? Uh, the world of, of social media and mass media and everyone kind of knowing what the Pope is up to is a very new thing. Like in medieval times, you probably didn't even know who your Pope was, right? Like your priest did, but you probably did not know who the Pope was if you were the average person. I think one issue is that modern Popes don't have as much of a concept of how many eyes are on them as opposed to how many eyes used to be on them. So maybe they could make a private statement of opinion to somebody without there being the same fear that's going to be propagated to the masses as this is now what the Catholic Church teaches. I, I find it hard to believe that someone as savvy as him, because you have to be somewhat crafty to become the Pope, mm. is this naive. I, I mean, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, this is my opinion. I'm not no, speaking sure. as Cathedra. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just to be clear. Um, I think he's shown himself to be a, a shrewd uh, figure. Uh, you know, he obviously got, you know, into the, the papacy. And I, I think I can understand the kind of thing where if this happens once and it blows up, then he, there's there's no question he's a bright man. That, that's not on the table, right? That he's not an intelligent, that he's not an intelligent man. Mm -hmm. I don't care how old you are when you're in a position that's that important. And if something, if you make a misstep and it blows up, I can give you one or two passes after yeah. a while, you know, what's happening. I understand that. Well, and I think he himself has also referred to himself as imprudent. So he, there's some understanding here. I get what you're saying that no, there should be some more care taken with, with the things that he says. I also want to mention this, and this is not me like engaging in like Pope Francis apologetics. I think people can probably infer what my opinion is on him, but the media does have this tendency to ignore the things he says, which are good and true and uphold Catholic teaching. So for example, like he's called abortion doctors, hitmen. Uh, he's referred to modern gender theory as demonic. I think, you know, you consider the fact that he's a human, he's from Argentina it makes sense that he would have some of the political leanings that he has. I'm not a fan of a number of the things he said and done, but I'm, I'm not sure what else. Wait, I wait, 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 can I, can I mention this? this? Oh yeah, sure. Sure. You're bad at this. By that logic, Pope John Paul II should have been a communist, right? Cause he's from, oh, no, 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 listen, listen, listen. I am, I am not at all excusing what uh, Pope Francis has said or done or, or the things that, that I would say are problematic. I'm just saying, I know there are people who will have like certain kind of conspiracy theories about like his role as an infiltrator. And I'm saying, I just think oh, like, oh, no, where no, he no. is. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying like, given where he's from in the world and what his life has been like, it makes sense that he would be where he is politically. Not that I disagree with his views or would excuse some of the things he's done, which I find to be distasteful. Okay. So I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to say that dismissively. I mean, I understand what you're saying. No, no, no. I appreciate that. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. We have a new sponsor with amazing Extreme Altitude Wines from the Bonner Private Wine Partnership. I just put out a bottle of their 9,000-foot Malbec the other evening at a dinner party I had, and everyone seemed to like it. It's grilling season, and the flavors go great with any meat you're going to have. They're unlike any wine you've ever tasted. Blackberry, leather, smoke, and a little dark cherry. These wines are almost impossible to get on your own because the producers deep in the Andes Mountains make limited quantity. The best part? They've cut out the middleman. No large markup. Today, I have an amazing introductory offer. If you visit bonnerprivatewines.com slash Michael, you'll not only get wine for 50% off plus free shipping, you'll also get a bonus bottle of small batch, limited production wine from their exclusive wine cellar. Four bottles for the price of three. It's a deal that's hard to turn down if you're a wine lover like so many of you out there. Just visit Bonner, B-O-N-N-E-R, BonnerPrivateWines.com slash Michael to claim your bonus bottle and become a part of America's most unique wine club. 
You guys ever feel like you're being followed around the internet? Maybe advertisers know a bit too much about you. So our sponsor, IP Vanish VPN, is here to help you take back your privacy and help you become anonymous on the internet. IP Vanish is a virtual private network, a VPN for short, which is an important tool that helps you safely browse the internet. You can use a VPN on your computer, tablet, phone, whatever it is when you're streaming media. When you use a VPN, all your data is encrypted. What you're watching, what you're searching, what you're reading. I know what you guys are doing, whatever it is that you're doing. That's important because what you're doing on the internet is no one's business but your own. For a listener of the show, IP Vanish is offering 65% off their annual plan, only $375 a month. Super easy to use. Turn it on with one click. It runs in the background, helps to protect you while you're browsing the web. Go to ipvanish.com slash malice and use promo code malice. That's M-A-L-I-C-E to get your 65% off savings. Their annual plan is just $44.99 for the first year with our discount. This is the time to sign up because with our discount and their current promotion, you can get a VPN for 65% off the usual offering. Here's the thing. IP Vanish is the best of the best. 4.7 out of 5 on Trustpilot with over 6,000 reviews. Remember, it's ipvanish.com slash malice to get the deal and start protecting yourself online. Let's get back to the show. Um, I want So why did you feel the need and how did you come to have a former libertarian as your bio? Yeah, that's a good question. So... We don't have good questions I, here. They're all there. Well, then let me be more honest. <laughs> let me be. I'm also, I'm speaking from a chair, though not necessarily ex cathedra. Um, <laughs> I think part of the, the, the reason was I became. Wait, I got to ask Seamus, why does your house look like the exact opposite of an Airbnb? <laughs> what is what is the opposite of an Airbnb? Like there's someone lives the here walls. all the time? Like there's this the air of despair. There's that kind of ceiling <laughs> because fan. Because I'm a cartoonist, face. Michael. Like where do, you, where do you expect me to live? <laughs> Something with color. No. Well, we actually just, just painted the walls white recently. I think, hold on. Let me adjust the lighting on my on the okay. light I have in front of me. Maybe yeah. that'll. Oh, oh, wow. It's a whole new situation. Maybe if I look orange, the walls will look white by comparison. I don't now, it's, now it's definitely an Airbnb. <laughs> let's also um, let's also apologize for my webcam here. That's probably part it's of fine. Where... the webcam. Oh, okay. It's, the webcam's actually decent. All right. I'm surprised to hear that. I was I was worried it was going to look like trash. The colors so again, are probably off. Former libertarian. Former libertarian. So libertarian is a word that's just thrown around in so many different ways. And it kind of aggravates me when people try to use a a political label in a way that they know isn't fully sincere and isn't what a lot of people are hearing when they use the term. And so I've always known that like, like if, if I didn't fully consider myself on board as a libertarian in the way that it's conventionally understood, I would not fall back on this. Like, well, I do technically want small government, et cetera, et cetera. Like I would just not be a libertarian. Again, I hate when people torture language. And so as I began to learn more about my, my Catholic faith, as I began to understand church Wait, tradition, is, that, is that something you came to later in life? So, yeah, I, I was raised Catholic. And throughout my teens, I think it tells all this time, right? But throughout my teens, I very much didn't take my faith seriously uh, or as seriously as I should. Right after I turned 20, I just had an experience that I, I don't talk about much, but it basically triggered a reversion. And I came back to my faith and started taking it more seriously. I started uh, practicing it as if my soul actually depended on it and not as if this was just something that was part of my identity or that I was taught to believe. And a few years after that, when I was 24, 23 or 24, I started attending the Latin mass regularly. And once I started doing that, I just started reading a little bit more on, on church tradition and you know, looking at the catechism more closely. And I just realized there were certain things in the catechism and there were also just certain things in church history that didn't mesh with libertarian thought. And I said to myself, you know, I still want the government, especially the federal government, to be a small fraction of its current size. But for me to say I'm a libertarian when I believe in things like the prohibition of pornography would be dishonest. Um, And I don't want to use language that places me in a category with people who would be upset to find out what my actual views were, given that I was using their label. How how, uh, this is an argument. This is an issue that I have have trouble wrapping my head around, Mm -hmm. because if 
I'm not a big consumer of pornography. Mm. And I, I think this is the kind of issue where it's become like if, if 15 years ago, you said you were for drug legalization, it'd be like, oh, you're just a pothead. Mm -hmm. And if you discuss like pornography nowadays, like, oh, you're a porn addict. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand, or maybe people are gonna think I'm disingenuous, but I think it's very difficult to ban pornography given technology. Because I, we li we live in an age where something where literally everyone listening to this will agree on that child pornography is one of the most unconscionable things that exists on this earth. And there was a New York Times piece recently that was showing how there aren't enough officers to even stop the pornography involving infants, right? <sighs> and the thing is, yeah. but here's the thing. Let's suppose we had a magic wand mm -hmm. and all child pornography was destroyed in the United States, we have an internet. So that's just going to mean they're going to go to Romania or they're going to go to these other countries and do that. I'm not saying we should legalize child pornography. I'm just saying this problem is so technologically difficult to enforce that it's, it's, it's so much more nuanced. I could agree with you that Pornography is a problem. People consume too much pornography that in our culture, people kind of hand wave away the negative aspects of it when it is very much a problem, especially for people, young men who are trying to form relationships with the opposite sex. Like I, I'm with you completely. But in terms of banning it, like how would that even look? And or, or is it the kind of thing? Well, we should at least try because obviously we should at least try with, with child pornography. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I totally agree with you that when it, when it comes to something like pornography, because of the advent of the internet, something like that is incredibly difficult to restrict access to. I think there are a number of ways to go about it. Like, Firstly, you could say maybe there could be something, there could just be more put in place to ensure the person watching is an adult, like rather than just being able to click, okay, I'm a grown up, and you let the person out of the website, there can be some kind of verification with their driver's license. But it, it's not even a question of what, the, what I think the solutions are that pulled me away from libertarianism, because one thing I still very much believe in from my time as a libertarian is that you can't just judge policy by its intentions. You have to look at the results. You right. have to look at the incentives. You have to look at what's even feasible. So I, I totally hear what you're saying. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying that I don't think it's, or, or conceding that I don't think it's possible to prohibit it. But my point is whether it is or not, I don't believe there's such a thing as a right to consume pornography. So I think regardless of whether I believe it can be made illegal, that would put me outside of the libertarian um, confines, right? Because I think if someone were to say like, I'm, I'm a libertarian because I think it's too difficult to ban porn, but I would rather porn be illegal, other libertarians would say, well, you're not really a libertarian because that doesn't line up with our values on unrestricted trade or something along those lines. So we, let's suppose someone is uh, a soy boy beta cuck, right? <laughs> sure. Would, would you have an issue and they enjoy watching, you know, some uh, whatever guy plowing some woman, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the language to use here. Mm -hmm. If that person paid a couple to make a pornographic film for his personal enjoyment, would you have an issue with that legally? Yeah. So the legal, so obviously I would have an issue with it from a moral perspective, Legally, I think we're kind of getting back into the question of how any kind of pornography ban would be enforced. Well, let's uh, go back to the moral thing. Like, yeah, what yeah. would be the moral issue there? Would you think this is worse than just regular pornography, or would you think it's because it's a kink? That's a good question. So, wait, what, what's the difference here? This is a guy paying a couple to have sex, and then he's he's watching it. Basically, right, he's having a private video just made for him. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's pornographic content. Um, I'm not sure what sets it, what would set it apart from other pornography. If I think what would set it apart is if two couples are just making a video and putting it on the internet and literally anyone can watch it, mm -hmm. whereas this is something, in effect, a personal relationship between the three people. Interesting. So it's not going out for mass consumption. Right. Um, I would still consider that to be a problem. Um, and if it were something that were possible for, for legal authorities to prevent from occurring... I would not be opposed to that, but I need to give that some thought because part of why I th like I think porn is intrinsically evil. Part of why I think there's a role for the state to step in is if because of like what the widespread distribution of pornography has done to our culture. Uh, if you're looking at this individual instance, I would still say yes because to sort of draw an analogy here, let's say we're talking about like drugs and wanting to make certain drugs illegal. It's true that part of the reason drugs are illegal is because we don't want like 
a massive distribution of drugs across the country. But those laws would still prohibit someone for, you know, making drugs for himself or just for one other person without distributing it to the public. But I, I, I see. I mean, you're for making drugs legal as well. So it, it would depend on the drug and it would depend on at what level. I don't, I'm not like pushing for prohibition, but I'm just sort of drawing an analogy. But I don't understand the analogy because if you are for drug legalization, then you would be for this legalization. No, 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 no. So my analogy is basically that your argument is this should be different, right? One, one couple making pornography for one person should be different from a company creating pornography so they can sell it to everybody. And I would, I would say to me, that's like saying it's different from, but it is uh, different, Seamus. It's it's create yeah. drugs. Yeah, no, no, no. I, so I agree, right? But if you have a blanket prohibition on pornography, that's still pornographic material. Um, the likelihood of catching that person or that person being found out when it's just for themselves and nobody knows about it is probably very low at that point. But I mean, I think the the issue that has historically happened with the Comstock laws in New York and things like mm -hmm. this is it, it, it if you ban pornography. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, this is not some hypothetical, like libertarian, mm -hmm. like pipe dream. This is, was the case in the late 1800s, early 20th century. They also banned materials teaching about prophylactics, materials mm -hmm. teaching about reproduction and things like that. Because if, if we're talking about finding pornography as, you know, mm -hmm. the viewing of sexual activity, that's also part and parcel of things like sex education and bad actors can, you know, back in the, um, you know, I think, I forget it was the Hayes Code in Hollywood, right? Mm -hmm. They had something where like, they tried to introduce, the government said, we're gonna start regulating movies. The movie said, no, 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 we're gonna do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So they introduced the Hayes Code and there were certain things you couldn't show. Like you couldn't show like zombies or something and you couldn't show like homosexuality and you couldn't show like criminals winning. Yeah, so you what, couldn't show a criminal break the law and not be punished for it. Something right, something like that. Like that. So what they would do is they would show like the bad guy and he's, having a great life and he's mm -hmm. with the women and then at the end, oh, and he gets shot at the end. But, you know, <laughs> it was just such a, like a tag on yeah. thing. Like, the whole point was very much glorifying the criminal. They also did this like in the Soviet Union as an aside where they would take an American movie, which was great. And then the, just the caption would be like, oh, they converted to communism and overthrew the government, like blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, so, oh, like, that's hilarious. Is, like drawing this line, like mm -hmm. it becomes – very difficult because there are certain things that involve human sexuality that I, I think you would agree is important for mass distribution. Yeah. So look, I totally agree. And I mentioned earlier in the conversation that it can be very complicated to draft public policy around anything and particularly something like pornography. Uh, obviously I, if pornography were to be banned, I would not want, you know, the distribution of, if, of any and all material that features genitalia to be banned. And so you have to create you have to carefully craft your definitions. That's really important. And so I think on the one hand, it's easy to say, well, like this is a common sense argument. Um, I know the difference between pornographic material and educational material, but of course at the, you know, at this point, there are so many different fetishes and there are so many Wait, different- Hold on, I can interrupt you because common sense arguments do not apply when it comes to the law. Well, and that is exactly, that, so that's my point. That's, that's yeah. the point I'm making is it's easy to fall back on a common sense argument and say, well, I know the difference between porn and educational content, but we do need to draft uh, and, and people do need to come to very clear terms on how they would define what pornographic material is. I completely agree on that. But, it's, it's not something that can just be, you can't just write a law that says no more porn, you snap your fingers and it's all gone. But, but it also goes the other way. For example, you and I might, for example, agree mm -hmm. that, okay, I can imagine a scenario, I, I, this is not my position, but let's, for the mm -hmm. sake of argument, say, I am for the case of torturing someone who is a member of a terrorist group, which mm -hmm. has involved the, the murder of you know thousands of Americans. Like that, mm -hmm. I'll make that exception, and then all it will take is one Congress to say, "Well, the NRA is a terrorist group." Yeah, uh, because politicians don't work in good faith, both mm -hmm. in directions you would like and directions you wouldn't like. So mm -hmm. very quickly, all it would take would be one blue state, mm -hmm. and they would be like, "Oh, well, this is just you know educational." Uh, because I learned something from it. So I, I, I'm not I, I'm not arguing with you. I'm just saying a lot of people, it's just like the kind of the gun control people. Yeah. They are, they're imagining the end goal, but they're not kind of thinking through the steps to get there. And it's infinitely more complicated than people realize. And I think the best short-term thing, and I, I think I suspect you'd agree, is to talk about the dangers of the, the, the pros and cons, and especially the cons, 
and have it be more like positive alternatives. Mm -hmm. So, so my point was more or less not to say that there's like a specifically specific legal course of action that can be taken to, to ban pornography, uh, or that it could be banned at the federal level or anything like that. My point is just to say that in principle, I am not against a ban of, of pornography. Uh, and so I think that would set me apart from libertarians. That was sort of my, my greater point with it. Not necessarily to say, I think this is how we could implement something like that. Are there any other issues where you find yourself uh, diverging from libertarian thought? There are a couple. So there, there are some that like aren't necessarily like libertarian, but libertarians are constantly calling you a fake libertarian for your position on it. And people will like sort of lump you in with a specific position if you call yourself libertarian. So like on uh, the question of like homosexual unions, whether you believe in gay marriage as a concept, that's something that like libertarians generally accept that I don't. And I noticed one thing the libertarian movement did, there was a lot of libertarians would say things like they think the federal government should just be out of the question altogether. But there, there seemed to be a lot of buying into this notion that it was really like this great civil rights struggle in order for people to, you know, be able to pressure the state to redefine what a marriage is to include their union, uh, even though historically the definition of marriage had been between a man and woman. And I saw that as more Orwellian than anything else. I didn't see it as like a political victory for freedom. And I was surprised that so many libertarians did. So even though it's not like an official like libertarian position to like believe in gay marriage, that is one area where I would set myself apart from libertarians. Then we have things like abortion, which is hotly debated. Libertarians definitely don't all agree on abortion. Or I should mention like I am and I always have been entirely pro-life, uh, even when I was libertarian. But again, that's another one that I'll state and people will go, this guy's not a real libertarian. Uh, there's there's definitely some others, but those are sort of the big ones that I could think of culturally. Um, how has your faith affected you like in your personal life? Is this the because is this like when I tell people I'm an anarchist, I don't talk to normies anymore. Thank God. But <laughs> it's the kind of thing where if you tell someone at a party that you're an anarchist, like you just know at the next time. The next 10 minutes of conversation are going to go. Where, where is it that you live right now, by the way? So I live in Savannah. I live down in Georgia. So, I mean, are, do you, when you talk to normies and, you know, they find out you're a religious Catholic, what kind of reaction do you get? That's a good question. So there, there are a number of different reactions that you'll get from people. Sometimes you get the dreaded, uh, I went to 12 years of Catholic school. Uh -huh. um, and there's, a little bit of a Dunning-Kruger effect we see take place there, which I don't blame anyone for because, look, I was a victim of that as well. I didn't go to Catholic school, but when I was younger, I thought I knew way more about the faith than I actually did. Uh, so that that's one response. Uh, another response is people will get abrasive. And honestly, it depends a lot on which hot button issue is in the news. So if I say I'm Catholic and abortion is in the news, people will say like, you know, I just like, hate how the church opposes women's rights or something. Uh, you know, if you say you're, you're Catholic when, you know, uh, LGBTQ issues are in the news, then it's, you know, oh man, like, I don't like what the church. So, so it can vary based on what's in the public consciousness. I would say more often though, than you'd, you would imagine people are like open to it. It's, and sometimes it's just people being polite, but you're led to believe that in this culture, if you like bring up your Catholic faith to anyone, they're going to be really turned off by it. They're not going to talk to you. They might even shout you down. And that totally happens sometimes. Like I, I was having a conversation with friends who were also Catholic at a coffee shop about Catholicism. And this dude went with a chip on his shoulder, basically started like getting extreme, like walked up to start getting extremely aggressive. It happens. Right. But for the most part, people are receptive. And then when they're not receptive to a part of it, they'll be like, okay, I get what you're saying, but like, I don't like that. But I don't think I've experienced a whole lot of like, ew, that's so gross and bad. Get away from me. Guys, we've got a different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show. It's a podcast you should definitely check out since you're a fan of high quality, fascinating podcasts hosted by interesting people, i.e. the exact opposite of this show. The show covers such a wide variety of topics to weekly interviews with heavy-hitting guests. There's a ton of episodes you find interesting. If you're a fan, you can check it out. Uh, there's an episode for everyone, no matter what you're into. He's got a lot of cool guests. Like one week, he's talking to a hostage negotiator from the FBI. Another week, he's talking to a cinematographer who discovered Lost City in the Jungle. Something for everyone. The podcast covers a lot. 
but one constant is his ability to pull useful piece of information from his guests. You'll find something useful you can apply to your own life, whether it's an actionable routine change or just a slight mindset tweak that changes how you see the world. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Here's the URL, jordanharbinger.com slash subscribe. The podcast on Spotify is jordanharbinger.com slash Spotify. And to learn more about Jordan himself, you can just go to jordanharbinger.com slash about. Let's get back to the show. Um, how did you get, so you're a regular on uh, Timcast IRL. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's always fun to watch you on that show. Thank how you. did you hook up with them originally? Yes, it is a funny story. Tim and I are actually, I, I, we, I've said this a million times, so I'm sure anyone who's heard me on his show is going to be annoyed hearing me say it again. But funny enough, Tim and I, we didn't meet until two years ago, but when I was like really little, our families lived in the same neighborhood, like, oh. like a block or two away from each other. Yeah. Um, and then my family moved out of the inner city and I grew up mostly in the suburbs. And, you know, I would say probably about two years ago, uh, maybe, maybe longer than that. It was, it was, no, it was longer. It was 2018 or 2019. He did jo- the Joe Rogan experience and he was arguing with Jack Dorsey and what's her name? Vidaya. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, that's the lawyer. lady. The, yes. Very good lawyer responses from her on everything. Uh, but Tim was really ripping him to shreds. So we did a cartoon about it and I couldn't do a Tim pool impression. And so I just reached out to him on Twitter and asked him to do his own voice. And he did. And like the lines are, you know, it's not like I'm Tim pool. I'm so cool. It's, it's like I'm Tim pool. And the script is very much making fun of me as well. And he read all the lines. It was, it was funny. I was very happy with how it turned out. And then uh, I think two years after that, I released a video about the McCloskeys and he shouted it out on a show. And then he reached out to me because there was a project he wanted to work with me on uh, a card game, which is actually still in the works. And I went out there and met him and his people. And then the next time I came out, they had me on the show. And then I was sort of a semi-regular guest. And then from about, January until the end of June, I was a regular co-host on the show and I had to step away, not because of anything controversial, but I could make up a story if you guys want to hear it or if the Daily Beast wants to interview me. Uh, But it was, it was more or less just that while I was on Tim's show, I was still running Freedom Tunes, right? So that's a, that's a full-time job and it's Freedom Tunes. Plus we work at the Foundation for Economic Education. I have some other clients and so I was kind of running the business and then every night from like seven to 11, uh, I was doing Timcast and it got to the point where I was like, all right, I just have to step back for a little bit and try to focus a little more on the business before I, I go back and do more podcasting with him. But it's been a wonderful opportunity. I love doing his show and whenever we're together, he and I are like constantly brainstorming ideas for like funny jokes or, or different projects. So it's been fantastic. It really has it, been great. It was really funny because I spoke at Fee, uh, the summer seminar. I, this must've been 20 um 15 2014 i don't remember mm-hmm. and before i went on stage the one of the people who run, ran the show said look um there's a lot of religious kids in the audience and someone said damn and they complained to me uh can you make sure you watch your language and i said one of my books has the word fuck on the cover like, what am I like, literally, like, what, what am I supposed to do? And then he's like, oh, and I go, I mean, it's fine. I won't curse, but I do have like Anne Frank jokes. Is that, you know, is that okay? And he's like, he, I, I'll never forget this. He goes, just do what you want. And, and, <laughs> and, and, I did, and no one complained. So I think so much of it has to do with context and how you present yourself. One million percent. Yes, that is. Uh, yeah, no. Is that like the big ask? You just ask for so much that they go, all right. Like, I don't. I don't even care. Do whatever you want. I. I think it's if you are a rogue, you can get. Uh, uh, Florence King, who used to write for the National Review, uh, she had the misanthropes corner. It was on the last page. She passed away. She's uh, this crazy old lady writer from Virginia. I remember this is one of those things that sticks to you for like 20 years. She had an essay and she wrote like, I'm really glad that all my neighbors think of me as the crazy old lady because I could do whatever I want. 
So she's like, sometimes like I'm a neat freak. So I'm like on my hands and knees scrubbing the lobby and they're, they don't bother me. And she's like, good. Like, and when people don't know what to make of you, it really gives you this kind of sense of freedom that people who are trying and it's in a, like a tie don't have. Interesting. I wonder if that's part of what we're seeing right now with all of these people kind of tr trying to create these weird new gender identities, like trying to have this uniqueness that gives oh, them freedom sure. without actually cultivating anything personality wise oh, yeah. that would put them in the category of like an uncertain person or an unpredictable person. Right. Because if you are using pronouns, no one's ever heard of before. I'm almost like an immigrant talking to you. I'm not comfortable <laughs> with the language and I'm yeah. on my back foot and I'm already in a subordinate position to you automatically. It's a, whether by design or, or otherwise, it's a very clever move to achieve a, a, a mode of dominance over pretty much everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and not always, a, it's, and sometimes a disingenuous one, obviously. Mm -hmm. Well, now I would also add too that part of where it falls apart, I wonder if this is, if it really is their motivation to kind of not be placed in a category like that. Because on the other hand, their responses to everything are very predictable, right? If you know somebody has these specific pronouns, you can kind of guess where they are with a pretty high degree of certainty on most political issues. Uh, you know how they're going to respond to you if you use certain language around yeah. them. Uh, yeah. Um, so they, you, they, they still, they get to fall very neatly in line with a group and actually a very large and very powerful group while still being a unique outsider in their own estimation. Uh, have you, were you ever on Tim when you guys got swatted? Yeah. A number of times. Tell, yeah. tell me what that's like, because like just emotionally, because to me, you know, maybe it's because of being born in the Soviet union. It's the kind of thing where I, I think I'd be rattled for quite some time. So a number of the times where I was there, we got swatted, uh, had bomb threats, that kind of thing. It was just, I would just pray through the whole thing. Um, like I remember one time the bomb squad, like I pulled up to the house to do the podcast and like the bomb squad was basically outside of there's a package that no one was going near and the bomb squad was coming. And so I just like went back to my car, grabbed my, you know, rosary and was praying and we went up and, and did the show. There, there was another time where I think it was before a show. Maybe it was during a show. It was during a show, but I wasn't on that episode, I think. Uh, and there was, you know, a bomb threat. So we had to leave in the middle of it. Honestly, it's uh, it's one of these things that you you want to take seriously. And in part, it's like, well, nothing has ever happened. But on the other hand, that is a way people can try to get your guard down. And then something actually does happen once yeah. you think nothing will, because it didn't the first 15 or 20 or 30 times. So it's definitely something I take seriously. I just, I would just kind of pray my way through it when it was uh, happening, uh, offer it up. And I'm just grateful that no one I care about has been hurt. So it's not like the, the cops came in pointing guns at anyone. No. Uh, so, okay. well, I was not there every single time they were swatted. So I can't tell every story. I think I was there probably like five or six of the times. Holy crap. Um, I, I know that, when the cops have come in, I think, I think the cops like walked up to somebody the first time it happened. Um, and, but they were able to figure out very quickly that he was someone in the house or he was someone from the house. So there, there didn't end up being problems. What has been your most successful video and have you figured out a way? Cause the thing that's very frustrating for all creators is like, you like, I remember when I was writing for the observer many years ago and like one article went wide, another one didn't. And you thought this was the one, you know, it's hard to predict. Yes. And the other is like, yeah, no one knows. Like we, yeah. we I, I, like we have no idea which, why, why something. So do you have any kind of cyst, like maybe looking at things how you've changed over time, what makes one video go wider than another or mistakes that you had made earlier that would have kind of capped the limit when it could have gone higher? That's really, I mean, yeah, that's something I, I think every creator thinks about from time to time. There have been a number of instances where I was working on a video when I thought, right, this one's like, this one's going to go viral. You know what I mean? Like, they, come on, this one, it's got all the right pieces. It's funny. Can you it's can name which one of those ones? Well, like, can you name one that didn't go viral? Every single one I've ever made has <laughs> No, um, they should call it failure tunes. I know, honestly, they really should. Failed cartoonist Seamus Coughlin can't make anything that goes viral. Uh, in terms of, I can pull up the channel real quick and just go through the last couple videos. It's, it's, it is one of these things where nobody really knows because in part, um, it's like, in part, it's about, excuse me, 
what time of the year it is, oddly enough. So you right. can have an issue that's huge and that everyone's paying attention to, but like, well, it's January or it's August. And so people aren't really paying that close of attention to YouTube. I think there were a number, like the one I did one, the, the, in terms of the most views I've ever gotten on a video, I believe that's um, fighting Nazis. Let me, let me see though. Let me look by a sort by popular. All right. Yeah. So fighting Nazis then versus now is my most viewed video. And, you know, just by virtue of the fact that the stuff that went viral earlier on collects more views over time, most of the yep. stuff all the way at the top are older. Um, not all of them, a number of them are pretty recent, but like the top three are all pretty old. Uh, and then what like top four, five, six, seven are actually really recent, but I'm not sure if you feel this way, like reading you, I, I think everyone does, but I'm not sure if you feel this way, reading your old uh, writing or looking at old podcasts, but like, it's kind of hard to look at things that you did a while ago, at least for me. Uh, I, I find a lot of difficulty in it because when it comes to like the art of animation and creating something that's really good and quick, quick and snappy and gets the point across, I've grown tremendously since I've started doing this. And my old stuff was so much wordier, like so much wordier. And so I'll go back and I'll watch these videos and I'm like, Oh, I like, why did people like these? I'm glad they did. I'm so glad. I'm like, I'm happy with them. And that's really just me being like scathing towards myself, but it can sometimes be hard to like watch some of the older videos I've done just because like now my, I have all these rules in my head about like the maximum number of words you want, like per line almost. I don't, I don't get quite that anal, but I really try to keep them short and punchy. And I look at some old ones that are much longer and I don't, I don't have a problem with like a long cartoon. It's, it's okay to have like a five minute cartoon as long as a character doesn't spend two minutes straight talking sure, before, you know what I mean? And so it's not that I'm against long stuff. It's just that I'm against like very long sentences, not for myself clearly, but for my characters. Uh, and so, yeah, when I watch old stuff, it could be a little, it can be a little jarring. Cause I'm like, why did I ever think it was okay to write a line that was like that long or that explicit? That's interesting. I have the opposite experience when, when I read old books that I've written, mm. I'm like, I'm, I'm waiting to cringe because the thing is when you're writing a book, you're going through four drafts and the editor has a draft and the copy editor has a draft and legal has a draft. And then you have the galleys and then you have the, the, you know, so you read it like 12 times. Right. Mm. And you remember all the mistakes, mm. but none of the mistakes are in the book. The mistakes are, you know, all those manuscripts and your and all the drafts and you're kind of pulling them out. So whenever I read old stuff of mine, I'm like, First of all, I don't remember it. There's this kind of like Dungeon Dragons yes, thing. This I get is, that too. Yeah, there's this Dungeon Dragons thing where like how it works is like if some if a wizard or magic user, I think they call wizards now, cast the magic missile spell, like the analogy is that it's gone from his brain. He has to read it all over again. So when I write a book, I don't remember it. So if I'm reading it, it's as if it's someone else wrote it for the most part. And I'm like, this is surprisingly good. This And I'm like, <laughs> I had a friend who I was talking to her and, and she rattled off a quote. And, and I'm, I'm like, oh my God, that's great. Tweet that so I can retweet and give you credit. She goes, it's from your book. <laughs> but I had no recollection from, so, but it's interesting. Like maybe it's a different process where y y y I'm editing it like over a year. You've got like two weeks. Yes. So it's going like to be a yeah. very different approach. Yeah, exactly. So these videos are, take a couple, I mean, Animation takes a very long time. When people hear we get these videos done in a couple days, oftentimes animators are usually shocked. Like, oh my goodness, that's incredible. Um, people are kind of shocked at how long that sounds. They're like, what? How could it take that long to make a minute short or two minutes short? And you're like, you have no idea. But yeah, with animation, there really is an economy of words that has to be considered because A, the longer it gets, you know, the longer it's going to take you to make. But B, people don't, like watch cartoons because they just want to see characters going back and forth and back and forth. They want, you know, sometimes that can work for certain cartoons if you have like a, a good script with good dry humor, but you kind of, you want more action. Uh, and I think for me, when I first started doing this, I was 19 and I was thinking a lot more about how to get a point across and maybe not as much about is this bit funny? And it's not that I wasn't yep. trying to be funny. And I think we had a lot of funny stuff in there, but if there was a joke that was funny, but that I thought like undermined the point, I wouldn't put it in there all the time. Sometimes I would, it would kind of depend. I, I think 
I've more and more just focused on like, is this going to make people laugh? And so what's what Freedom Tooth has really been over the past couple of years is mostly me like looking at a current event, just trying to make a funny little short about it. And then because I'm being honest with myself when I write it, my values come through in it. But I don't sit there and go, how can I get the conservative position across on it? You know, like Rittenhouse is a great example. When I wrote the Kyle Rittenhouse script, it was like, this is so ridiculous that we're even having an argument yeah. about this. So I just wrote about how ridiculous it is that we're having an argument about this. I wasn't like, well, if you look at this statistic on like defensive gun use and then, you know, it was just like, this is so easy to make fun of. So I'm just going to make fun of it. I'm not going to, I'm, but I, I'm not going to sit here and like try to convince somebody who doesn't already agree or anything like that. Like this is, this is just funny for its own sake. The first video of yours that I saw that made me aware of, of your channel was the one uh, teasing Dave Rubin, where he has a series of guests and he's just agreeing with all of them. And I think that heavily feeds into the criticism he gets, uh, which I don't think is valid criticism, that he doesn't push back enough on his guests. I run my show in a similar way. I don't like to push back on the guests. It's about what they think and their thoughts. If I'm friends with someone, I'll be more kind of antagonistic because mm -hmm. there's that space there, but I don't want people to be scared to do my show. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of reaction did you get from him um, when that video hit? Because I think it kind of did take him down a peg or so to this day. Do you think so? Yes. Oh right. man, I, well, that was not my intention. It was funny because he commented saying, I agree, which was okay, yeah. kind of- He has a good I, sense of humor about himself. He has a it? very good sense of humor. The reason I made that video was not because, it, it's funny because after I made this video, people were responding to it as if I was trying to comment on Dave Rubin at all. I wrote that script because I wanted to try out a couple different impressions of different public figures oh. in the conservative sphere. And I was like, well, where do I put them? I was like, oh, well, of course, on the Rubin Report. Like, where else? That's where everybody is. That's where all the conservatives go. And so I put this little animated cartoon together. And I kind of, I didn't really have a Dave Rubin impression, but I thought he pronounced the letter G kind of funny. He's like, when he says agree, he says agree funny. He's like, agree. And so I was literally like, I was making fun of him for how he says agree, not like the fact that he says he agrees. Now it stuck out to people and they were like, Dave Rubin does agree with everyone all the time. And I was like, I didn't even know that that was a criticism people made of him. I was literally like just, and it was originally, it was actually just a writing exercise um, to see if I could write like these different public figures, write in a way that they speak. And I sent it to my friend and he's like, you he's like, you have to make this, you have to make this. And so I made it. But I didn't think, I really didn't think of it as a critique of Ruben. And I, I didn't think it was going to have the effect that it had. And so when I uploaded it, I remember one or two people commented like, oh man, this is really brutal. Or like, this is scathing. And I was like, oh my goodness, that was not, like, I felt bad. Cause I was like, that's not my, that was not my intention. But then he commented saying he agreed. Um, and I very much appreciate it. I ended up uh, speaking to him at some point. So it was. Yeah, he had like he had a very good sense of humor about it. But I just want to mention, you know, I wish I could sit here and tell you that I just really condensed this criticism of him into a short form video where he only had one line of dialogue and it really pulled his entire persona apart. But it was genuinely just a writing exercise. And I thought he said the letter G funny. Uh, has he ever had you on his show? No. I don't know why. <laughs> I... Uh, he, maybe, maybe he's busy. No, he's, yes, I would say so. Also, no, I'll say this. We never ended up being able to produce it. Um, we, we, we never fully put it together. Uh, it kind of fell by the wayside, though. It's something we could always wrap up. We, when I met him, this was back in like 2019, right? 2018 or 2019, probably. Um, and yeah, it had to have been. And he, when I, I met with him, like he, he I, I wrote a second script for like a second Ruben video and he recorded it and it just, we, we were working on it and then freedom chains became more current events based. And like, by the time I reconsulted the video to try to finish it, our style had changed so much that it was like, Oh, we'd probably have to redo a lot of this, but it's still there. Like I could still produce it. So what, uh, what are you working on now? If you can tell us. 
Oh man, a lot. So right now I'm actually working on uh, like the immediate project is an episode of the debunkers, which we are hoping to be able to release tomorrow. There's been a little bit of a problem with YouTube copyright striking it. I've never had this happen before, but I uploaded a preview. We had a sponsor. So I had to upload the preview ahead of time to send to the sponsor. Um, and there's still some work that needs to be done on the video. So I, I was giving them a rough draft and YouTube flagged it as like not only ineligible for monetization, but as something that cannot be viewed. Oh, yeah. I never yeah. saw that. Okay. Yeah. Now it's unlisted. So maybe if I made it public, that would be different. But no, it was listed as uh, something that like can't be viewed. So I'm trying to sort that out right now. Wait, what, what literally, what was the language they used? I've never like it's. And I, all right. So let me pull yeah. this up on my computer right now. And do you have any ideas why that would be the case? Like what about it set them off? Um, they claimed that it was just a, because it was a moment from the daily show. Uh, because so, so basically what we were, um, debunking was a segment that it was a segment that Trevor Noah did on CRT. Um, and yeah, so under visibility, it says blocked. This video contains copy of my, this video contains copyright material. As a result, it has been blocked worldwide. Okay. And so the copyright claim uh, came up. I disputed it. We'll see how that goes or if they'll get back soon. I'm not, you know, that's obviously kind of a tricky situation because I don't is have that the kind of days. thing where you uploaded it and you got this instantly or it's something that happened after a minute. So that's a good question. So um, I uploaded it Saturday and I was wrapping it up Saturday night because I, I don't work Sundays. Uh, and so it was, it was uploading, uploading, uploading. And then like when I came to the computer just to check on it, um, not really to work on Sunday. I, I just, I noticed that it said this video was blocked and I was like, I've never seen a video. So this is algorithmically. So th there's probably, mm -hmm. what happens is they probably, uh, the, the algorithm, uh, compared the audio mm -hmm. to audio that has been kind of whatever. And then be like, it's a match. Therefore you can't upload this. Cause otherwise, cause what happens is people upload, um, cable shows onto YouTube mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as a way of avoiding people paying for cable. And they have there's yeah. lots of workarounds people use, but this is something that they're trying to crack down on, uh, and I think that's what ended up snagging you. Not them not realizing it was fair use, them thinking you were uploading episodes of the show. Well, I think that's what it is because it says so. Like content news is the Daily Show, and what's interesting is it says content is found from like 11 minutes to 13 minutes. The whole video is me responding to Trevor Noah. Yeah. For whatever reason, it only flagged this short little yep. moment. So I'm wondering if it might just make sense to like slice that moment Correct. out of the video yes. and then re-upload it. Yeah, it's kind of a pain and it might alter the message of the video, but it's probably what we're going to have to do because we, you know, I don't do have Seamus. 30 days. What you can do, Seamus, is if you put, instead of it being a two-minute block, mm -hmm. if you just break into 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, even just like a pause in between, I think that would get you through, is my understanding. Wow. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank think you for the advice. Like, I'm trying to upload a song that's like two minutes straight of that mm -hmm. song. Whereas if I had a clip of a song and talk about the clip, clip of a song, talk about the clip, it's a very different scenario. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how I, I could be completely wrong, but that's my understanding of how the system works. I'm going to have to look back at that because it's possible that it, it is possible that that's the most time he spends speaking uninterrupted by right. the debunker characters. So yeah, I'll have to go in there and see if I can get that fixed. I sure hope so, man. It takes, th this one is long by the way. So for those of you who don't know, we even though we mostly do short form animated content, there's a series called The Debunkers, and it's just these old, two fat, rich geniuses who spend their time debunking YouTube videos, basically, in their home theater. And those will end up being like 25, like anywhere between like 15 and 30 minutes long. So this one's 25 minutes long. It's a really big one. Uh, so if you guys like The Debunkers, you're really going to appreciate this, I think. And I'm excited for it because I think we have a lot of good uh, arguments in it, um, and y'all will enjoy it. But let's just hope that I'm able to split it up in a way that that doesn't have the algorithm eat me. Uh, Seamus, running out of time. What oh, has been your favorite part of this interview? When you wouldn't get off my back about illegalizing pornography. No, honestly, I think my favorite. I'm giving you a hard time. I think my no, favorite. Just, I just made a face at the word illegalizing. <laughs> illegalizing. Yeah, I know that's also a very weird word. What banning, prohibiting. But you know what? If legalizing is a word, why shouldn't illegalizing be a word? I'm using it. Let's uh. You know what? Actually, I'm going to Google this. You are welcome.
Welcome to The Inevitable. This is Motor Trend's new podcast about the future of the automobile. I am Johnny Lieberman, the senior features editor at Motor Trend, and I am joined every week by my co-host, Mr. Ed Lowe. That's me. I'm the head of editorial for Motor Trend, and boy, do we have an amazing list of guests that we're going to be chatting with. We've got the godfather of the environmental movement, Ed Bagley Jr. Derek Jenkins, a whole bunch of actors, celebrities, car crazy folks, people from in and outside the industry. Can't wait for you to join us. We're talking about the future of the car. This means everything from electrified vehicles to cars that drive themselves. Come check us out. We're on podcastone.com or anywhere else you find your favorite podcast. We're also on motortrend.com and youtube.com slash motortrend. Saddle up and get ready for Westerns Weeks on Pluto TV, all for free. We're coming in blazing with favorites like True Grit and Once Upon a Time in Mexico. Or immerse yourself in binge-worthy series like Yellowstone and Walker, Texas Ranger. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies, TV shows, and more. The best part? It's free. No credit card, no sign-up, no fees. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming now.